Uh, I'm very pleased uh, this morning to be moderating a panel. It's a panel on race. We are going to start uh, with Rick Sander from UCLA School of Law, and then we'll uh, move directly to Jennifer Coe from Western State. Uh, she will focus on immigration. And then Brad Earhart from University of Tennessee, who will be talking about anti-discrimination. And after we're through with the presentations, we hope to have plenty of time for discussion. So with that, uh, Rick. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm just delighted to be invited. Uh, the structure and subject of the conference um, spurred me to try to explore some new ground. So I hope you'll find <coughs> I'm going to advance some material today that I haven't spoken about before and sort of try to think about things in, in the broadest possible context. Um, so I think it's been striking over the last two or three years uh, that there has been a, a, a resurgence of discussion about racial issues. We've had, a, in a way, a whole series of kind of traumatic national encounters with race, um, including the Ferguson shootings, um, uh, campus unrest last fall, the Oscars just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I think a lot of this is, is exciting to me as somebody who works on race. I like to see uh, greater attention given to racial issues. Uh, <coughs> and I think in particular, it's important because there are so many fundamental racial disparities uh, that are still very problematic. If you look at sort of the path of racial progress in America, um, a, lot of, a lot of the disparities that existed in the 1960s have narrowed very sharply uh, in areas like um, voting, um, representation in Congress, um, college graduation rates, uh, earnings of uh, families with advanced degrees or two-parent families. But I think in many ways, two-thirds, three-quarters of the black population has been largely untouched by much of this progress. So this chart shows the change in the black-to-white ratio of median family income from 1970 to 2009. You see, not a lot of progress there. Um, if you look at levels of housing segregation, something I'm going to return to in a couple minutes, there's still pretty large disturbing disparities there. Black white gaps on test scores have not really shrunk in the last 30 years. So a <coughs> lot of very fundamental problems that need to be addressed. However, I think uh, what's dismayed me about a lot of the national conversation is that it's, um, it hasn't seemed to me to focus on the right things. A lot of discussion about things that are, are sometimes outcomes rather than underlying causes, uh, focus on symbols as opposed to sort of structural uh, design of American society, uh, and a tendency in many cases to focus on racism as kind of an all-pervasive explanation of racial inequality in American society. So what I want to talk about today is um, the sort of the ways I would, in which I think our national discussions tend to be structured, both inside and outside of academia. Um, and what I see is, as um, non-constructive about that, what I would like to see the conversation focus more on, and why I think that, uh, that um, even a, uh, a sort of uh, uh, approach to race that de-emphasizes racism and discrimination nonetheless is consistent with the idea of having race conscious strategies in public policy. So that's a lot. We'll, we'll see how much I can, I can approach this. So let, let me start with the Oscars. Um, huge amount of discussion about uh, the fact that in the last two cycles of the Oscars, there were no uh, people of color or in particular African Americans nominated for in the actor categories. Total 40 nominations uh, with no African Americans. What there has been much discussion of is, is kind of looking at underlying patterns. So this is a, a graph generated by The Economist, which I didn't see anywhere in the American media. The Economist, of course, is a British publication. And it looks at the percentage of uh, racial groups in different kind of relevant demographics. 
And I think what's particularly interesting is that if you look at the sort of middle bar on top roll, rolls, you see that over the period that the economist examines, this is like a, an eight or nine year period, there's a fairly significant number of blacks in major roles. Um, and relative to that number, blacks are actually overrepresented in, in Oscar nominations and more overrepresented in Oscar wins. So um, there are many other disparities here that, are, that, are, that suggest sort of significant racial problems, like the big difference between the Latinos in the general population and Latinos in major roles. But the focus, the sort of unremitting focus in our, in our public discussion has been kind of on the, on the idea that Oscar wins and Oscar nominations reflected a racist American Academy of, of Motion <coughs> Pictures. And it doesn't seem to me, looking at this data, that that's where the problem is. So I think that we've had a, a kind of a, a very intense but incredibly superficial discussion about what might actually be issues going on in Hollywood. Um, and, and part of, I think, my general point is that one doesn't see statistics like this, at least I haven't seen statistics like that in the American media, I think partly because journalists are afraid to present statistics like that. So another example is police shootings. <coughs> so police shootings, clearly a very serious problem. I, I don't disagree at all with points made in the prior panel about sort of the big racial disparities in the criminal justice system and, uh, and sort of the enormously harmful impact that uh, those racial disparities can have on African American communities. But there's a, there's a sort of a way in which we talk about this that I think is not particularly constructive. If you look at the percentage of uh, shootings uh, by police of African Americans, it's about 32% of the total. If you look at the percentage of black arrests compared to the total, it's about 28 or 29%. That's a much smaller disparity. I mean, reading, uh, reading a fairly broad range of media over the last couple of years, one would have the impression that you know, there was like a 10 to 1 disparity in these things. Uh, and that's, that's not the case. More broadly, if we look at arrests and sort of the racial component of arrests, we see that if we, if we look at, at data that sort of gives us some clue of what might be the pattern of actual criminal violations and compare that with arrest rates, the disparities are much smaller than we, than we tend to assume, that we certainly tend to think even in academic discussions of these matters. So, so you know, I think constructive discussions about criminal justice reform need to talk about both the incidence of crime and the incidence of race in the criminal justice system. Okay. Um, so there are three specific problems I want to talk about as ways that we can try to um, uh, more constructively deal with uh, uh, racial disparities. First is uh, housing segregation, which is kind of the main thing I'm, I'm working on right now. I'm trying to finish a book to appear early next year on housing segregation, how it's evolved over the last 100 years, and, and what we can do about it. This, uh, this table shows measures of housing segregation in, in major <coughs> American cities over the last uh, 50 years. And what you can see, I think, from the blue line um, this is a, a measure of the index of dissimilarity, which is what proportion of, of African Americans in urban areas would need to move to have the same residential distribution uh, as white Americans. And uh, 100 on the scale would be complete apartheid. Zero would be complete integration. 0.3 to 0.4 seems to be what groups that, that uh, move very freely uh, in society experience as their level of dissimilarity, like white ethnic groups. Um, so segregation levels have fallen since 1960. That's the blue line that sort of has the average. But if you decompose that, you see that there are really two different trends. The red line represents major American cities with substantial black populations. The green line represents a much smaller subset of cities that have different demographic conditions. Here, I've identified areas that are less than 5% black. You can get even stronger contrast if you add other demographic differences between those groups. Um, so, some progress, but a long ways to go. This chart looks at measured housing discrimination levels over the same, roughly the same period. And what's striking is that <coughs> housing discrimination after the passage of fair housing laws at the end of the 1960s fell quite dramatically according to every measure that we can find. And if I had more time, I would show you a dozen different ways we can document this. The 1970s were clearly a transformative decade 
both in terms of uh, the actual behavior of people providing housing and the actual movement of people within urban areas. Um, so so a, a, it's kind of a simple racist explanation doesn't work very well when you're trying to account for what happened in housing segregation. Um, so let me show you some pictures quickly. <coughs> this is, this is uh, where blacks were concentrated in Chicago in 1970. Red areas indicate intense segregation. Gold areas are substantial segregation. Green areas are, you can think of as areas of integration. That's Chicago in 1970. This is Chicago in 2013. Um, you see the west side and the south side, which has historically been the black concentrations. Chicago's index of dissimilarity during this time fell from about 0.9 to about 0.8. Here's San Diego. This is an example of a city that segregated a lot. In 1970, you know, it looks better than Chicago did in 1970. It sort of looks like Chicago does in 2013. But here's <coughs> San Diego in 2013. Um, even by 1980, it had dramatically reduced its level of, of segregation. And, uh, uh, and, you know, essentially became a fundamentally different place in terms of the freedom with which blacks could choose neighborhoods in which to live. There are still a few areas of black concentration that may well reflect black preferences. But this is a sort of what I would consider to be a, a housing market functioning more, much more for blacks the way it is for other groups in other American cities. So what's the difference between Chicago and San Diego? I can't give you a full account of what I think are all the explanations, but fundamentally the idea is that there are a few fairly simple demographic structural differences between uh, different American cities that can account for about 84% of the variation in how much urban areas desegregated after 1970. <coughs> That's a very, very high statistic for, for this type of social science explanation. So I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that we have a very good understanding of how desegregation can occur. And we understand that, that the things that stimulate desegregation are things that are fundamentally sort of demographic and about trying to short circuit patterns of neighborhood resegregation. Um, dealing with fair housing seems to have happened pretty nationally. Uh, I think further fair housing anti-discrimination measures are called for, but I don't think that's the main thing that's driving these differences. So therefore, um, well, let me come back to this. Um, therefore, we could actually uh, probably produce substantial desegregation. I think we could get most American cities down to level of segregation below 0.5 with some fairly modest but activist strategies. And I think some of those strategies would be more efficient if they were race conscious, like providing mobility grants or interest subsidies that are tied to the degree to which a person moves into a neighborhood where they are a significant minority. Um, if you provided those in a, in a fashion that was essentially available to everyone, in other words, everyone in any metropolitan area can find areas where they would be a racial minority, and therefore uh, everyone could be eligible for this type of subsidy. If you had st strategies like that, strategies like expanded housing counseling, and so on, perhaps some things we can talk about in the Q&A session, I think we could reduce segregation significantly. The real point here is that, is that there are solutions out there and that a measure of race consciousness is, is probably a way of making them more efficient, possibly not indispensable to having them work. Um, why should we do this? These charts uh, show uh, differences in, in sort of black-white outcomes um, <coughs> or, or outcomes within the African community across areas that are segregated or integrated. And what's striking is that I haven't found, and I think, I think most social scientists would agree with this, if you look up, up, across a broad range of sort of potential changes in society, there is nothing that has as profound an effect on the bulk of the African American population and their outcomes as desegregation. Desegregation affects test score gaps, it affects mortality levels, it affects unemployment, it affects single parent parenthood, <coughs> um, Almost anything that you can look at, almost any of the things that we tend to uh, think of synonymously with racial inequality in the United States are fairly powerfully affected by housing desegregation. The problem is that in, all, in an awful lot of our discourse, if you look at typical media accounts of the housing segregation problem, which have increased in the last couple of years, there's a very heavy tendency to focus on 
housing discrimination is the cause. In other words, racism <coughs> is sort of the default explanation. And the discussion often doesn't get anywhere beyond that. The black-white test score gap, um, as I mentioned earlier, has remained largely stable for the last 30 years. There was a, a lot of shrinkage of the gap in the 60s and the 70s, partially as, as some of the worst inequalities of school funding were corrected. But in the last 30 years, it really hasn't changed much. Um, uh, the gap is important. It has a variety of fairly dramatic effects upon many different African-American outcomes. And we now have a pretty good understanding that about two-thirds of this gap exists among black five-year-olds, and that a fairly small number of <coughs> factors can completely account for the racial effect. In other words, we now have very good social science evidence completely explaining a large early gap in racial cognition in non-racial terms. Okay? And these are some of the things that have been identified in the research as very important contributors to that gap. Things that are correlated with race, but they're not, they're not racial in any intrinsic way. Um, there's been a, a, you know, a, lot of, a lot of talk about um, test score gaps, about trying to provide more equal access to college and so on, but very little focus on sort of the root causes. And I think these, are, these need to be an important part of the policy discussion, an important part of the public media and academic discussions and they tend to be neglected. Um, the last example I want to give is mismatch, the area that I worked on quite a bit. Uh, and this chart illustrates the operation of mismatch. This is a chart that looks at the probability with which people who uh, enter college interested in science end up getting a bachelor's degree in a science, engineering, or math field. And to understand what this chart is saying, the idea, the idea behind it is that the people here are being having a whole bunch of characteristics controlled for. In other words, like their general entering, uh, their general entering credentials, their level of academic preparation, what courses they're taking, gender, and so on. And the variable along the bottom is how far their credentials are from the median of their class. So the idea of mismatch is that if you, if you uh, receive a large preference, and you end up in a school where your credentials are well below those of your classmates, a variety of uh, backfiring effects can happen. And this is an example. You're much less likely to complete a, a STEM degree if you are negatively mismatched with your classmates. This also suggests you're more likely to complete a STEM degree if you're positively mismatched. Um, there, are, there are other countervailing things that suggest you shouldn't try to go to the worst school you get into. Uh, but this is a pretty powerful effect. And part of what's really interesting and powerful here is that the two lines on the bottom that are almost on top of each other are one is for whites and one is for underrepresented minorities, mainly Hispanics and blacks. And those two are on top of each other because mismatch is not fundamentally a racial effect. It's fundamentally just about the structure of where you are in the class. Um, here's some data on law school mismatch. Uh, this data became very recently available because of uh, public records lawsuits that, that I and others have filed against schools to disclose. I wrote about mismatch a decade ago, and other people have written about it since. They've generally been hampered by very poor quality data. It's been almost impossible to get the legal academy to voluntarily disclose systematic information about how credentials affect ultimate bar outcomes. But now that the data is starting to come out, mismatch appears to be even a more dramatic effect than we thought. If you look at this row of LSAT folks with a 150 to 152, you can see that at my law school, if you enter with those credentials, you have about a 31% chance of, of passing the bar. You have a 51% chance if with the same credentials you enter at UC Davis and a 79% chance at Ar University of Arkansas. Now, you might say Arkansas has an easy bar, but actually Arkansas has a bar that's about <coughs> as difficult as California based on a variety of other evidence. So I don't think it's, this is simply measuring a difference in, in bar outcomes. Um, so mismatch is a, is a pretty powerful phenomenon. And, and yet, if you look at the public discussion about mismatch, um, there's, it's very easy to find folks being quoted in prominent places saying that <coughs> there is zero evidence that mismatch is an issue. Um, 
And, uh, and, and if you look at sort of what the Legal Academy, for example, has done about this problem over the last 10 years, you would think that that was the sort of the official line as well. Yet in the last two weeks, uh, one of the lead articles in the American Economic Review and the lead article in the Journal of Economic Literature both had major, extensive, very carefully vetted uh, reviews of the literature showing mismatches quite a large problem. So, what I'm suggesting um, is that our public policy on race needs to focus much more on core problems, not on symptoms. Um, that when the public discussion focuses on symptoms or focuses on things that really aren't problems <coughs> and we become obsessed with those, we need to step forward and try to put out counter arguments, try to broader, broaden and contextualize the discussion. And I don't think we should dogmatically exclude race consciousness as a reaction to sort of uh, the feeling that, uh, uh, that, that talk on race or talk about racism tends to lead to counterproductive solutions. I think there is a role for race consciousness if we could figure out how to really integrate into strategies that attack more fundamental problems. I also think that we need to try to develop a norm of moving away from <coughs> racism and racist as terms that we use as sort of automatic reflexes to talk about racial disparities in society. Because I think that tends to uh, not only be counterproductive in itself, but I think it's, it's sort of coarsens the dialogue, it's destructive of dialogue, and it probably tends to produce political repercussions that we, we might not really like. Um, and I think we need to sort of embrace and, and appreciate the fact that discrimination in many, many areas of American society has undergone tremendous declines over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and that, to me, really gives us a solid base to believe that constructive solutions can be broadly embraced in the United States and that we really can make progress on these issues. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Jennifer Coe, and like other speakers, I'm just so grateful to be here. Thank you, Bob, for inviting me and for putting um, this wonderful lineup of speakers together. So I'm a law professor and also direct a clinic and supervise students working in the immigration area at my law school. I'm also a Christian, and I'm going to be speaking explicitly as one, but I'm not a professional Christian. I have no formal theological training. <laughs> I'm very much an amateur and not a particularly good one at that. <laughs> My spiritual journey has been deeply influenced by what I think are fairly mainstream figures within Protestant Christianity, um, like Tim Keller, the pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, C.S. Lewis, and others who I think, again, fall sort of very much within the sort of refer reformed and evangelical tradition. Um, but I'm going to talk about Christianity and immigration law. And <coughs> immigration law is an area of law where seeing injustice is very easy if one looks. In the clinic that I direct, um, we represent a range of non-citizens, and our clients right now include a severely disabled man who's lived lawfully in the country for the past 27 years. He almost died while in immigration detention last year. Um, another of client of ours is a survivor of domestic violence who's facing deportation, um, despite the fact that she's lived in this country since she was an infant. Um, and there are many others. And taking a step back just to assess the immigration system more broadly, immigration law, especially with deportation, is a system <coughs> where the human stakes are high. The Supreme Court has repeatedly characterized deportation as not punishment, but still um, an, an area in which it, it invokes all that life is worth living for. Um, and yet just a week ago, a senior immigration judge defended the longstanding rule that people facing deportation have no right to a government-appointed lawyer, even if that person is a three-year-old. Um, the immigration said in deposition that it wasn't easy, but that he believed it was quite possible to teach a three-year-old how to defend him or herself in immigration court. <laughs> <laughs> 
with a trained lawyer representing the government on the other side. So my goal actually for today is actually not to get into a detailed list of examples where traditional notions of justice, things like proportionality, impartial adjudication, or right to review are violated within the immigration law. What I instead want to do is focus on the broader discourse and movement politics within immigration and to think about how those politics implicate, if at all, Christian theological commitments to the gospel and to grace and, to, and kind of vice versa. And so um, even if you don't share my own set of spiritual commitments, I do think that an understanding of what evangelical Christianity purports to believe is relevant to engaging in the state of politics today. There's a whole strand of literature and kind of news articles in the media right now that are trying to make sense of the um, reported broad support <coughs> or existence of support amongst evangelicals for Donald Trump. And I actually don't want to get into that right now, but it certainly um, sort of, I think, reinforces the relevance of getting into what it is that Christians believe. Um, and Can you just move back a back little? Back a little? Oh, oh I'm move, too loud. OK. <coughs> a little bit. Too much, too much. OK. I'll, 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 okay. okay, so um, grace is a central belief for Christians, and many Christian thinkers will identify grace as the doctrine that sets Christianity apart from other religions. Um, and it is very briefly the belief that Christians are reconciled with God not because of our good work, not because of our accomplishment, but because of the work and accomplishment of God himself <coughs> as seen through the life and death of his son, Jesus Christ. It incorporates the belief that all individuals are fallen and broken, both because of individual sin, greed, pride, selfishness, what have you, and because of corporate sin, exploitation of the socially vulnerable, corruption in the courts, refusal to pay a laborer his wages. And while this sin should separate us from the divine God, God himself has received the penalty for this sin through the unjust trial and execution of Jesus Christ and his subsequent defeat of death itself through the, res the, the resurrection. Um, we are recipients of a costly grace. As Tim Keller puts it, the Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for <coughs> me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to me. And this leads to both a deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. Grace is distinct from religion, or the belief that one's moral conduct merits God's blessing. And so Tim Keller also says, those who believe that they have pleased God by the quality of their devotion and moral goodness naturally feel that they and their group deserve deference and power over others. The God of Jesus and the prophets how saves completely by grace. He cannot be manipulated by religious and moral performance. He can only be reached through repentance, through the giving up of power. Okay, so what does this have to do with law, with any law? Um, I'll bring in one more Keller quote, um, who, who I think was influenced very much by Nick Walterstoff. So I have to say it's very intimidating and um, honoring to even have you sitting there. Okay, so he says, Christianity is not only about getting one's individual sins first given so we can go to heaven. <coughs> that is an important means of God's salvation, but not the final end or purpose of it. The purpose of Jesus' coming is to put the whole world right, to renew and restore creation, not to escape it. It is not just to bring personal forgiveness and peace, but also justice and shalom to the world. From the law professor perspective, the late William Stuntz suggested, in fact, that Christianity might have very radical things to say about the law because it is, after all, a radical faith. Its leader was tortured, given an unjust trial, executed by the powers of the state, as were many of its followers. And so Stuntz was a scholar of criminal law at Harvard Law School, and he suggested that Christianity provides a framework from which its followers might be deeply concerned about the state of criminal justice. In an essay published after his death, he was especially critical 
of evangelical <coughs> Christian political support for increasingly harsh and punitive criminal justice policies. And he tied it back to grace and the gospel, reminding us that if the Christian story is true, then each of us is a guilty defendant without hope, save for a divine advocate. <coughs> that is precisely Christ's role in this supernatural litigation. The accuser becomes the advocate, and the client is acquitted, not by his own merit, but by <coughs> the merit of his lawyers. Right? In our justice system, the wealthy are acquitted because they can buy the best lawyers. But the Christian story turns that story upside down. The lawyer buys, redeems the client. <coughs> okay, so how does this map on to immigration discourse today? Um, I'm gonna reflect on what are very loosely three rough positions within the immigration debate, and I'm gonna reflect on each um, <coughs> using the gospel and grace as a lens to do so. So these three general positions are what I would call, one, the restrictionists <coughs> or the enforcement-oriented, sort of Trump, Cruz, Rubio, the state of Texas in litigation. Um, a second position would be more reform and discretion-oriented um, for the good immigrants, uh, sort of largely reflected in the Democratic position and President Obama and prosecutorial discretion and in legalization proposals. Um, and I'm also going to talk about a third, which I'm going to call sort of a resistance movement, which is equally critical of Republicans and Democrats, um, focused primarily on the human, social, human and social costs associated with deportation and <coughs> detention. Okay, so let's first talk about the, the sort of restrictionist position. Um, so Donald Trump's views on immigration have attracted global attention. There are obvious links to race, especially in his unapologetic deployment of harmful racial stereotypes. Mexicans are rapists and criminals. He would make Mexico pay for a wall, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Cruz and Rubio have criticized him in turn for not being tough enough on immigration. Um, I think this overall position is also <coughs> reflected in Congress's failure to pass comprehensive immigration reform from 2013. Um, and so while Trump's views are, in my view, extreme and offenses, his immigration policies in many ways are not particularly outside the norm of the restriction enforcement first um, position. So the policy goals of this position are focused on enforcing the laws on the books, either to effectuate the de deportation of all 11 million individuals who are currently present, or to enact policies that make it so difficult that um, those 11 million sort of choose to leave. It's reflected in the position of the state of Texas and 26 other states in litigation right now before the Supreme Court over whether to provide temporary relief to <clears throat> up to five million people who are parents of US <coughs> citizens and lawful permanent residents. And so evangelical Christian support for the restrictionist immigration position is not universal, but it does exist. It's grounded primarily in passages um, Romans 13 calling for um, Christians <coughs> to obey civil authorities um, and to, to give deference to the powers that be. Um, I would actually argue that to the extent that evangelical support for this particular position is explicitly grounded in the Christian faith, then it overlooks the role of the gospel and grace in guiding Christianity to begin with. Um, there's the belief that the God who saves all of us who have violated the law, I think is actually critical in understanding that harsh and technical application of the <coughs> laws that leave little room for grace should actually cause Christians to, to wince. Um, and it, but it reflects our own impulse to be rewarded for our law-abiding nature. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So the second is a sort of reform and discretion oriented position. I think it's epitomized you know, relatively well by President Obama's policies. And in fact, in November of 2014, 
the president announced the program of deferred action for parental accountability where he would extend safety temporarily from deportation and work authorization to the parents <coughs> of US citizens and lawful permanent residents. And so interestingly, the president actually invoked the Bible in his speech announcing this program. He announced that scripture tells us we shall not oppress a stranger for we know the heart of a stranger. We were strangers once. Um, you might, you know, and this has a lot of resonance with the scripture. Strangers are included within the group of the vulnerable in the Old Testament with widows and orphans um, multiple times. Um, I would also describe this position as a position of restrained enforcement. So in the same speech, the president emphasized, we're looking out for families, not felons. Okay. But I might also call this a position in favor of the good immigrant. So the one whose only transgression is presence without permission, who has a family, works hard, <coughs> and has no encounters with the criminal justice system. And so this same, same philosophy is very much reflected in Senate Bill 744, the, the, con the comprehensive immigration reform legislation that was not allowed to go forward. Um, it would have provided a, a 10 year sort of pathway to citizenship for um, what I'll call loosely the good immigrants. Uh, the DREAM Act um, emphasizes that students who came through no fault of their own but for an immigration law violation um, should be included within the political community. And so there's, a, there's been in recent years a decent upswell of evangelical support for comprehensive immigration reform. The evangelical immigration table was formed. Um, the hashtag blessing not burden in response to the current refugee crisis because treating an immigration law violation as an eternal and unforgivable sin would seem to go against the basic premise of the gospel. Um, and so I could end here, and I'm actually supposed to end here. Um, in the past I've stopped here in many ways I am here, um, but I will actually wrap up. I think there's actually an important critique to be made even of the president's position, the position that many mainstream immigration reform advocates have embraced where we say, well, let's at least provide legal status to the good immigrants. And the harm in that, the third alternative category, is to look more closely at the harms associated with illegality, to look at um, the punitive nature of our immigration system and to focus more of our attention, even explicitly as Christians, on the families that are separated, the um, increased incarceration of non-citizens, the racial impact, and again, the overall harm. Um, so I'll leave it there, except I'm gonna share one, one song lyric, which I think is sung pretty widely in evangelical churches across the country, but I will share with you that it is the lyric that comes up in my mind most frequently after I visit immigration detention centers. And it's from Hillsong United. Um, Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth to eternity. And so I would suggest that looking at what this third position has to say about our immigration laws um, could in fact do that for more of us if we look. Thank you. Wow, those are, those are great, powerful presentations. Um, thanks a lot, Bob, and to others for uh, allowing me to be here. And uh, there's so many great folks here at Pepperdine, and it's great to uh, get to see where you do all your work. And I'm honored to have the, uh, the chance to share a few ideas today. Um, so I have recently, get my timer going, I've uh, recently begun work on an article entitled, 
uh, tentatively symmetry in the design of anti-discrimination law. And it's in the most infant of stages. So uh, the good news is I'll be highly interested in your questions. The bad news is I probably can't answer them. Um, but in all seriousness, I, uh, I'll be really interested if, if uh, there are places that might benefit from uh, different examples or different framing. So first things first. Um, what, what do I mean by symmetry? And here, what I'm referring to is what Owen Fiss uh, referred to over 40 years ago as the protectorate. So those covered or protected by anti-discrimination laws. Um, I define symmetry as um, an approach to anti-discrimination law where everyone is covered or protected on the basis of a trait that everyone has. Um, and so most of our anti-discrimination law is symmetrical, so Title VII, uh, is, a, is a pretty simple example of that. Race, sex, religion, uh, national origin, and color are, are all protected, and uh, it, it protects all people on those basis with the possible exception of religion, uh, given that some people don't have a belief system which would constitute a religion under Title VII. Same with equal protection, laws drawn uh, along racial lines are subjected to, to the same level of scrutiny, uh, no matter the motivation, benign or otherwise, and no matter the race. Uh, there's only one level of scrutiny for race or national origin or religion, et cetera. I uh, define an asymmetrical approach to anti-discrimination law as one where only some are protected or covered, even though everyone has the underlying trait. And I think the best example of this is the ADEA, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. We all have an age, but only those over the age of 40 are protected under the ADEA. And then the final uh, approach I've termed uh, tentatively quasi-asymmetrical, uh, and that works like the following. Only some are covered or protected, but only some have the underlying trait. Um, and I think the best examples of this include the Americans with Disabilities Act, where only some people have a uh, statutorily cognizable disability, or the FMLA, where uh, only some have need to take sort of medical or other types of leave that are uh, protected under it. Um, so this, I hope this document, I hope you can see it, it's just in my handwriting. Um, <coughs> I thought it would then be interesting to sort of sketch out uh, how different approaches to anti-discrimination fit within these definitions that I've come up with. And so this is just a very rough graphic, and if you have additional examples uh, in the questions or the comments, I'd be super interested in them. So, right, everyone's protect protected on the basis of their genetic information under GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, passed in 2008. And uh, as I've already mentioned, almost everyone's protected symmetrically under Title VII, with the one exception being for religion. The Equal Pay Act, uh, uh, protect symmetrically on the basis of uh, sex. Equal protection, for reasons I've already stated, is a fairly symmetrical application. Asymmetry to ADEA, again, um, if we're talking about traits that everyone has. And then for quasi-asymmetry, I've uh, added to the ADA and the FMLA uh, Title VII's uh, religion and also USERA, which involves uh, protection on the basis of military service. Um, so. Uh, I'm not the first or certainly won't be the last to think about how and why and when we protect against discrimination and to try and theorize that. Many have written on the topic. And so what I've tried to do with the next slide is sort of sketch out visually for those who are familiar with the previous literature where my theory, I think, fits uh, w within the previous literature. And I'll just spend very brief time here. Again, it's in my handwriting, so it may be hard to see. Um, so uh, I guess what I want to flag through this uh, drawing is that I think symmetry is unique and it's not coextensive uh, with the coverage of any of these other theories that have entire literatures devoted to them. Um, and this I think demonstrates or uh, generates, I should say, some of my excitement about the possibilities uh, in thinking about symmetry because I do think it's different uh, and it could potentially harness some of the advantages associated with these other theories without some of uh, the disadvantages. Um, when and how is a probably different topic for a different day because talking about any of these uh, would, would require time. But a, a very brief out application would be with race, since that's what this panel is about. Um, for anti-classification, we say, oh, well, we never classify or consider, um, or we never consider or classify on the basis of race. With anti-subordination, uh, theorists would say, well, we do whatever we need to to challenge oppression, and sometimes that means we have to classify on the basis of race. Sometimes we do that through, say, affirmative action. Uh, symmetry would say, 
Um, let's keep race consciousness, but make sure that same types of protections are available to all. So anti-classification always works for that because it says let's not consider trait X, which is a symmetrically designed protection. But symmetry goes further to pick up anti-subordination protections that may classify uh, sometimes and are available to all races. And then universalism would say, well, let's, let's forget race. Let's accomplish equitable results through some uh, universal means, such as class-based affirmative action or just cause termination requirements or Texas's top 10% rule, something like that. Um, the next logical step is to consider what's good or not uh, potentially about symmetry. And I think understanding what's at least uniquely good uh, can help us think about the potential application of this theory to real world issues. I've broken out three distinct categories for thinking about the potential benefits, expressive, political, and substantive. So with expressive, uh, I'm thinking here primarily of the message that a law sends, uh, the signal that it sends, which may stand not only to encourage compliance, but very critically often influence social norms, like how we think about uh, issues, how we think about problems. One benefit of uh, symmetrically designed anti-discrimination laws is that it emphasizes uh, commonality rather than how we're different. So it can help build solidarity on particular issues. For example, uh, none of us should experience discrimination because of our race or our sex. We're in this together. Uh, one counter argument might be that symmetry sometimes waters down the message, that many times we're not trying to say that a particular type of discrimination is wrong, we're trying to say that a particular group has been subordinated, um, and we should do something about that. Uh, politically, um, the political uh, component here re refers to the fact that laws require, um, laws require support to pass and then they require some level of support to be implemented uh, correctly by judges. And so one benefit I think of symmetry is it has the potential to really secure political support as well as aid in judicial implementation. So laws that are symmetrical are likely to be seen as sensible and fair. Uh, when anti-discrimination schemes treat people differently, people often push back or label that sort of differential treatment as special treatment. Uh, the counter argument could be that um, it, it may be that a broad law is still seen as principally benefiting a narrow group. And this has been sort of true of the FMLA, even though it was a uh, very, very sort of like broad and symmetrical approach. It's still often seen as a law that is intended primarily to benefit um, uh, women. So. Uh, and then finally, uh, substantive. And with the substantive component, I'm primarily interested in how well these laws challenge discrimination. So it may be that a symmetrical approach casts a broader net, since it's difficult to uh, predict which groups within a broader ground of identity will experience discrimination in the future, and therefore less likely to need future amendment for the scope of the protected class. Uh, as some of you will probably know, we had to amend the ADA uh, just a few years ago, which is an asymmetrical statute, because the group that that statute was set up to protect ended up being too narrow. Now, again, there's, there's reasons, I think, for why that's not a symmetrical statute, but my point is uh, the same for this. The counterargument would be that we don't need symmetry as a matter of substantive justice, because with many of the asymmetrical or quasi-asymmetrical statutes, uh, will all be covered at some point and just when we need it. So most of us will uh, age and become at least 40 years old. Um, we'll all become disabled if we live long enough, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so unfortunately, I have uh, not worked out the part of the article which I imagine may be of most interest, and that is um, how might this theory yield new insights uh, about discrimination law or suggest the need for reform. And at this point, I'm very sort of unsure as to how I come out about the potential virtues of symmetry uh, or lack thereof. One potential application, though, that I think may make sense is changing the ADEA to protect all persons on the basis of age. I think there's two potential benefits that slot within the three components I broke out earlier. Um, expressively, uh, I think that the ADEA is a statute that is seen as um, uh, well, it's, in, that it's intended to protect older workers, and it does so in only very limited cases. And so I think changing the ADEA to protect all on the basis of age uh, would signal that the ADEA now, as a matter of principle, prohibits 
uh, using any age as any proxy for merit. So that would mean taking a very, very robust uh, anti-stereotyping approach where age is generally recognized to not be a good proxy for, for measuring merit. Um, politically, I think, it's, I think it's reasonable that it could uh, yield more generous judicial interpretations of the statute. The efficacy of the ADEA has been severely restrained uh, in large part because it's been seen as securing only the special rights of older workers. Um, so uh, I have just a minute. Um, I guess I'd say a few questions for you. What's your reaction? Um, does symmetry come up in any interesting ways in the areas of law in which you all are experts? And are there other anti-discrimination examples where you think the application of symmetry uh, might be intriguing? So thanks.